Autonomous Initiative. I am your host, Tiffany Madison, and this is the first roundtable discussion of many that will be uh, conducted. We are trying to launch the first edition of a conversational discussion with a panel of American combat veterans that have served during Operation Iraqi Freedom or Enduring Freedom. The, person of the, the purpose of this discussion is to cover current event topics involving national security, the war on terror, foreign intervention, and policy from a veteran's perspective. You can find not only the transcript, but also the video at our YouTube channel, liberty.me, at uh, forward slash YouTube, and on my publishing site, tiffanymadison.liberty.me. So before we begin with our first questions and starting our discussion, gentlemen, please introduce yourself. Tell us your name, where you're from, your years and branch of service, and your MLS, please. Hi, my name is Andrew Phillips. I'm from uh, British Columbia, Canada. And uh, I served four years in the U.S. Army as a combat medic. Do we still have Kelvin? Oh, I hope so. No, we lost him. <laughs> you want to keep it, Michael? <laughs> My name Sorry is... There. Kelvin's been having a couple of uh, technical difficulties with uh, Firefox and Google Chrome, and they're, they're not uh, cooperating friendly. So uh, we'll go ahead and jump in, Michael. And when he comes back, we can let him introduce himself. All right, sounds very good. My name's Michael Patrick. I'm from Providence, Rhode Island, initially. I currently live in Topeka, Kansas. Uh, I served in the United States Marine Corps from 2005 to 2009. My MOS was 0311 for infantry. And that's me. Nice. Well, thank you, gentlemen, so much for taking time out of your schedule to be a part of this discussion. Um, well, before I, I kind of jump in, I um, wanted to kind of give whoever's watching this kind of an overview of why this type of discussion I feel is very important, and I'm sure that uh, many of you will agree, you know, based on our previous discussions, um, you know, it strikes me that we have so much of our foreign policy discussion completely dominated by American talking heads that the elite media and mainstream media constantly put out there. Um, you know, the John Boltons of the world, the Dick Cheney's of the world, um, that are professional bureaucrats, and it's very rare that we actually get to speak to real people about real issues that concern us all, from foreign policy to Iraq intervention. And it's it, it's incredibly discouraging, I think, for most Americans to actually have to listen to what people are, are basically telling them to think, instead of people who have actually been involved in these wars, who actually have a personal attachment and association to what happens in Iraq based on their previous experience. So it's important to me to give a voice to all of you and to make sure that you know anyone who has questions about anything that you have to say here feels comfortable asking in the questions in the comments section, either on YouTube or on my publishing channel. So again, thank you, gentlemen, um, and let's jump in. So uh, first thing first, let's discuss uh, today the current situation in Iraq and the rapidly evolving crisis. And as most people who are watching this are aware, ISIS, an Islamic extremist group, is sweeping through cities challenging the security of Baghdad and other cities that Americans fought very hard and lost their lives to take. As many are aware, after the Iraqi people joined with U.S. forces to oust these extremist factions, almost all of Al-Qaeda and all of the factions al Nusra that were cooperating in Anbar province, many people were hoping that once we evacuated these cities and left Iraq, local factions would eventually find a way to rule as one or at least find a way to cooperate. Obviously, that has not happened. So as many experts warned, uh, Washington once again was wrong. So many of you served in Iraq, and critics say that the war was pointlessly destructive. Others say the impact on the local population was both negative and positive. That it had its good, uh, it has its pluses and its minuses, its good and its drawbacks. In your, in your opinion, what did the American people accomplish by actually toppling Saddam and occupying Iraq? Andrew? Well, I think the biggest thing we got out of uh, going into Iraq is we got rid of a terrible dictator. Uh, whether there was weapons of mass destruction or not, this, it's debatable, but we do know for a fact that he used chemical weapons on his own people. And it really makes you wonder uh, what he would do to his enemies if that's what he's doing to his own people. Uh, even uh, when, uh, when it was reported that Assad used chemical weapons on his people, uh, people who were against the war in Iraq uh, were very concerned that he might use chemical weapons on um, on neighboring countries, specifically Israel. And um, 
Another big thing that we got out of uh, going in there was we were able to uh, heavily invest in the Iraqi infrastructure. Um, that wasn't very ep economical for the United States, but uh, after the Persian Gulf War, uh, Iraq really needed uh, new schools, new roads, and just a basic framework for um, creating an economy that could flourish. Okay. Uh, Michael? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I was in from 2005 to 2009, so I didn't see the start of the war, and I didn't see the end of the war specifically. I got right in the middle there. Um, I can't speak as to what it was like when Saddam was in power, and it's hard for me to speak for what happened after we pulled out, other than what I get on the news, and uh, as you said, the talking heads say. Um, from my understanding and research uh, of Iraq, after I left the Marine Corps, most points to life being better under Saddam which is a hard thing for Americans to hear, but uh, as Andrew pointed out, infrastructure, schools, medical accessibility, court systems, these these were in existence. People had agency to actually deal with problems in their life. You know, as long as they weren't Kurds. <laughs> in which case, they got steamrolled. Um, in regards to... Um, I lost the plot for a second there. Oh, uh, in regards to uh, the chemical weapons issue, uh, I, I think that's a trap that we've fallen into and we still haven't pulled ourselves out completely in regards to the talking points from the talking heads. Every weapon, and I'm not a chemist and, or a scientist, but as far as I know, every weapon is a chemical weapon, regardless of it's sarin gas or bleach bombs or chlorine bombs. And uh, this this extra attention that certain weapons get in comparison to others, especially when we, well, the United States government itself has dropped white phosphorus in Fallujah uh, and other parts of the world. I don't I don't see where we get off getting that worked up over chemical weapons. I don't want it to sound like I'm a Saddam apologist or anything like that, but I it it, it still does me in when people make a big deal out of that. I have to agree with you. Um, Dresden, I mean, the fire bombings that took place, uh, both the UK and the United States during World War II, um, our actions since that era in Vietnam um, really do almost evaporate any moral authority we have to um, determine what other nations can do, and especially um, using chemical weapons that we almost funded in uh, several different instances. Um, Andrew, I kind of want to challenge your notion that all this infrastructure was provided. Um, you know, during, and maybe you can shed some insight based on things that you have seen, especially in regards to medical care. Um, many of the you know, books I've read and the veterans that I've spoken to uh, during crisis counseling or even post that VA interaction or just the, the gentleman that I interact with often that served there really felt extremely frustrated because they didn't believe that the United States government and Washington bureaucrats really had a plan. And so once we actually went in and toppled Saddam, we didn't, you know, the, the Amer Iraqi people were looking to us for some actual organized structure and a plan. And we were kind of like, man, it's up to you guys. Now figure it out. So water, sewage, I mean, electricity, there are huge, huge swaths of that country that had none of that after we came in and, uh, you know, bombed and obliterated entire areas of the country and destroyed and leveled, um, you know, huge parts of Baghdad, including water treatment facilities and electrical grids and all that fun stuff. So, um, you know, what is it exactly, if you can be specific, that you feel that we provided in terms of infrastructure that still stands or that maybe has a legacy into the future? Um, I, I was uh, a part of um, uh, some uh, security details that helped uh, provide security for uh, building schools that was that was a big thing while we were there in late 2003 early 2004 um, I understand we we caused a lot of the destruction blowing up of roads destroying uh, just obliterating Baghdad during a uh, shock and awe and it really is our fault and I, I definitely don't think the uh, the US government should um, 
should get off easily for what we did. But um, after the fact, we did we did build roads. It took a little bit uh, a bit of time. Um, it, it didn't happen immediately, and I think that's where the Iraqi people were frustrated. Was we just came and destroyed their home um, that we had no right to be there, and they would have rather had Saddam than us uh, shake everything up over there. But eventually, after time uh, passed and some people got their heads out of their asses, um, <laughs> the, uh, some stuff did start to happen, and uh, and the, the infrastructure there was uh, starting to build. It's it's deteriorating a little bit more now, but um, I, I really am trying to look on the bright side of things and not say this was an entire just utter failure. Which is understandable. Um, you know, comparing Afghanistan and Iraq, I don't know if either of you served there. Um, I've done quite a bit of uh, very depressing research on the money pit. Um, Vice did a phenomenal documentary where they actually went to this massive power grid that cost the taxpayer, you know, millions and millions of dollars, and no one in Afghanistan knows how to maintain it once we leave. <laughs> So, you know, we've donated aircraft and we've donated military equipment and it's all in a scrapyard. So literally the materials that build an Apache helicopter, you know, this million dollar machine, nobody knows how to fly it, refuel it, fix it, you know, repair it. So they're just scrapping the metal and then selling what the taxpayers, uh, I mean, again, war is a racket. So we get foot, foot the bill. It stays in Afghanistan, they scrap it in metal because they can't figure out how to operate with it, and then it goes to fund, you know, Islamic extremism um, over in Pakistan. Um, so, yeah, that's it, it's different. Compared to Iraq, where they're actually using some of our weapons, which, again, I don't agree with, I am anti-war, but they um, are using, actually, our weapons and learned at least how to, because they were a more advanced society. They actually had doctors, they had teachers, they had educators on a higher level than... Um, Afghanistan did prior to our invasion and after our invasion as well. It's a fairly modernized place um, in comparison. So um, maybe not a total loss, but uh, yeah, definitely a, a way more expensive war than uh, ever should have been or, or than they anticipated. Uh, my second question is kind of folds into that. So, you know, there is a lot of uh, armed, you know, chair quarterbacking and, you know, uh, looking back in retrospect, I'm guilty of this as well. Um, when you look at the, the invasion and the complete and absolute lack of plan, um, this goes from Paul Bremer disbanding the Iraqi military all the way to, you know, Petraeus basically, basically having to step in and fill the shoes of what diplomats were doing on his own just to, to try to come to some peace with these local tribes. There were various strategies that were employed in the Iraq war, um, starting from the beginning all the way to the pullout. What, in your opinion, were the most successful strategies of the war that made the most progress, and who or what of that strategy, you know, who allowed that initiative or policy to be who's responsible for it? I think the the greatest strategy that came out of their uh, for the Iraq War was being able to uh, the Marines working with the people of Fallujah to uh, get rid of Al Qaeda in their city. Uh, when I was there, uh, Fallujah was a huge hotspot for uh, for violence. Uh, convoys were constantly getting hit. Helicopters were constantly getting shot down. And um, I'm not sure exactly when or why this happened, but um, shortly after uh, after I left in mid 2004, the Marines took over, and it just kept getting worse and worse. And finally, at some point, the uh, the people of Fallujah, uh, I guess, had had enough and said, we, we were sick of Al-Qaeda killing our children, controlling our lives, uh, and they decided to work with the Marines there and get rid of uh, Al-Qaeda, um, pretty much eradicate them completely from the city at the time. And uh, I actually had the, the pleasure of uh, talking to uh, Donald Rumsfeld about this, and he really saw that as a, uh, a turning point for the U.S. in the war. Um, pretty much nothing had gone the way we'd planned other than the original invasion of Baghdad up until that point. And it was kind of this, uh, this little bit of uh, the ray of light shining through the clouds at the time. Michael? Um, 
the most successful strategy, um, what usually gets talked about in regards to the most successful strategies or the competing successful strategies are, are of course, the Surge or the Anbar Awakening. Um, I think that's what Andrew's uh, alluding to there. I don't know if that was during that timeline in Fallujah or not, but it was when the local populist leaders came to the Marines specifically and said, hey, we need weapons, we need logistics, and vehicles would be nice, and we want to make this work. Uh, if you want to know more about that, I highly recommend Cobra 2 and Endgame. Almost, yeah. A little, little bit longer. Go ahead, Michael. Sorry. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> Sorry. Um, it's uh, quite all right. Uh, in regards to the most successful strategy, though, I would say, I would say the Iraqis not signing the SOFA that President Obama wanted. I would definitely say that was the most successful strategy uh, for helping uh, Iraq. It made it so that we could not stay there any longer and do any more damage. Uh, behind that, I would say Petraeus's idea when he took command of getting us out of the giant fobs to forward observating ba uh, observation bases and putting us out in the little battle positions. Uh, it put us out amongst the Iraqis, but we didn't have the support or the numbers that we had previously. So it forced us to interact with the Iraqis, get to know them better, and uh, understand their wants and their needs, also their complaints. Um, I would say that was the second best strategy in regards to the American perspective. That was probably one of the worst in regards to the Iraqi perspective, because instead of Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, and other Islamic extremist groups fighting American forces at large bases such as Al-Assad or Al-Qaim, they were out on every corner outpost attacking them there. So I would, what worked best for Americans may not have worked best for Iraqis. I, I would agree with you. Um, the Anbar Awakening would probably be my choice um, as well. I think that a lot of people overlook the very critical uh, relationship that took place. Essentially, they had these radical extremists that were killing people for drinking alcohol, and as a you know, you're seeing the same thing happening in Syria as well. You know, they didn't want to work with the Americans, but they didn't want to work with those guys either. And so it took so much uh, bloodshed and slaying and massacring before they decided to, all right, who is, the, who is the devil that I know? Who is the worst in this situation? I'm going to go with the least worst. Um, and the American people who had seen, you know, our, our uh, brothers die, and be mutilated by, you know, IEDs that the locals were helping these uh, radicals plant in exchange for money, that was able to be curtailed a little bit because they decided to actually participate in that awakening. Um, neocons and proponents of the war also use that as this kind of strategy that should be emulated at all times. Unfortunately, it has miserably failed in Afghanistan, and there's no evidence to show that that would um, actually help in Syria should Americans born and intervene. It's almost like a, um, an occupation has to take place in order for that to uh, ever unfold again successfully. And given the loss of life and the bloodshed, even though it did um, end up being an ultimate success in terms of what was good for America, um, I wouldn't trade another Johnny Johnson from flyover country for a thousand of them to have um, freedom and an awakening, in my opinion. So um, moving on to the next question, what was the most detrimental or counterproductive policy initiative? Who is responsible for that initiative becoming policy, and what do you think should have been done differently? Um, if you'd asked me this uh, a couple years ago, I probably would have said the Patriot Act. Even though it's, uh, it really does had more to do with 9-11, uh, it was really part of the whole Bush era fear-mongering. Um, everybody's a suspect because, uh, because America's... In, uh, uh, everybody's at danger, uh, at risk. Of being hurt, but uh, lately I've been looking into um, the Iraqi Kurdistan area, and I think uh, the creation of this is the worst thing that came out of the war. Wow. Um, for, uh, for anybody uh, who doesn't know about um, Iraqi Kurdistan, uh, the the province was created after the initial uh, invasion of Iraq. 
And this really pissed off Iran and Turkey because they've been trying to uh, squash uh, Kurdish nationalism for quite a while. And uh, a lot of the speculation going on from those countries right now is that um, they're trying to develop a, 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 an actual Kurdistan uh, state. And if this happens, uh, Iraq, Iran, and Turkey are all going to lose large oil reserves and uh, pipeline access to the Black Sea. And on top of that, it's causing uh, a lot of problems in the Iraqi um, uh, what do you call it? Um, the Iraqi parliament uh, between the uh, Sunnis and the Shias, and uh, really causing um, what do you call it? Balkaniz balkanization in the Middle East. And let me see. Um, the United States. Here I got it written down right here. Um, it's been funding the the Kurdish Workers Party and the Kurdish Democratic Union Party, and they are have been essential. A great part of a lot of the attacks we've been seeing in Syria and Turkey over the last couple of years. Uh, basically, uh, we've created this, uh, uh, this situation a lot like Israel, where uh, uh, between the, uh, the Jews and the Muslims, where there's a lot of hostility. We've created this, uh, this heavy militarized zone where it's, uh, people and weapons are easily transported in and out of Syria and in and out of the uh, group ISIS, and it's causing a lot of the problems that um, that the world is facing, or that the area is facing right now. And I'm not exactly sure who's responsible for, the, uh, for this policy, but um, I think it was an absolutely terrible idea, and we, um, it, it'll be even worse if they create Kurdistan, uh, Kurdistan country. I, I do have to disagree with you really quickly. <laughs> okay, go right ahead. Um, so, so the Kurds really um, have been so oppressed violently, and, and during you know the time that we occupied Iraq, they were one of the few um, people not trying to kill our soldiers. Um, so, you know, to me, the three-state solution um, is maybe not viable, but it's it's kind of a potential, hopefully, goal since it doesn't look like these groups can uh, cooperate. So I would like for them to hold Kirkuk and to have an oil-rich area since they have been so uh, decimated for so long by whatever tyrant um, held the power to do so or whichever local population was uh, currently in power. So I like that they didn't ask permission. I like that they took advantage of this anarchy that the U.S. invasion kind of created um, and filled the vacuum with order and taking resources and now is kind of developing their, their own little um, enclave in the north. It does pose some huge problems, especially in relation to how the other countries will respond to that as well. Um, but, you know, in, in terms of whether or not those people deserve to have an own homeland, it is very, very um, hotly contested in that area, obviously. And um, current, I actually kind of support their efforts, and I, I hope that they're able to hold on to it. The last thing that they, you know, should have happen is to become a, a tool or a student for Iran and Syria. So it'll be uh, very interesting to see how that plays out. And, hopefully not as uh, violent as uh, previous situations have uh, unfolded. So really quickly before I move on um, to, to uh, let Michael answer, um, I wanted to introduce Ryan Treat. He just joined us, um, unfortunately Compute Mountain with Central Time, and we lost Kelvin as well. So we were supposed to have four uh, panelists here, and next time it'll be a little bit more uh, seamless. So Ryan, if you want to unmute yourself really quickly and just uh, introduce yourself, and then um, we'll go ahead and, uh, and uh, let Michael answer the question as well. Say hi, and you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, it's up top. <laughs> All right, so um, my name's Ryan Treat. Um, I been in the Army for about 11 years. I served two tours in Iraq, OIF 1 and 2. I went into Iraq um, about a week after the initial invasion and spent a year in Sadr City, and then I spent a year in the job with the 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment, or OIF-2. Um, still active duty. Um, um, what else did you want to know? <laughs> no, that's great. That's perfect. Um, that's actually exactly what it was. I'll post the question in the chat here um, so that you can get up to speed. Uh, Michael, if you want to go ahead and tackle that question, let us know what you think. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Ryan. Good to have you. Uh, oh, thank you. Not at all. Um, the question was, what was the most detrimental or counterproductive policy uh, policy enacted 
Um, hands down, uh, after the invasion was over, the worst policy got put into place. That was aiding and funding, supplementing and subsidizing Al Nusra, the Free Syrian Army, and Al Qaeda out of Syria, which ended up spilling over into Iraq. Uh, we saw a similar um, we saw similar results in North Africa after Libya was uh, bombed in 2011. I believe that was, and uh, the Maghreb and the Sahara went to pot because it destabilized an area and it helped Al Qaeda. At least Al Qaeda in regards to the Arabian Peninsula and then North Africa. Um, now there is no one in place to stop them. We are funding them, and uh, they are not lacking for troops, money, or help. I would say the funding of Al Qaeda and Al Qaeda um, affiliates, hands down, is probably our worst policy in regards to. Uh, the safety and uh, prosperity of Iraq. Good, um, thank you, Ryan. Um, okay. Well, I thought I, I always felt like the most counterproductive aspect of what we were doing in Iraq. And I was in Sadr City when I was in Baghdad, kind of a uh, kind of a hotbed area. Um, is the, the nature of an occupation itself? You have to use heavy hand techniques. So the nighttime raid, the gun confiscation, the checkpoints, all of these things that no American would put up with for a second are things that are necessary as part of an occupation. So we spend so much of our time actually you know, oppressing the people who ostensibly increase their freedom, which is kind of a, a lot of cognitive dissonance there. And then um, again is the uh, collateral damage. I mean, everybody always talks about. American life lost, but really the American life lost is just a smattering compared to the, 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 the smaller numbers, the smaller estimated numbers of 100,000 Iraqis in the day. So, um, like I said, the, the, it's not really a, a policy initiative, but it is like it's the nature of an occupation. You're gonna, there's going to be a lot of collateral damage. There's going to be a lot of what we consider rights, right? The right to bear arms, the right to free movement, the right to go outside at nighttime are things that Iraqis allowed to have under the American occupation. Nice. Yeah, I think, um, I think a lot of people would agree with you. Um, I know what disturbed many of our veterans that had to be the occupier, the person that oppressed those very liberties that, you know, we're going to be celebrating tomorrow. Um, we're just simply not possible for the local population as the nature of an occupation goes, and that was very disturbing and haunting for a lot of those guys. Um, yeah, Michael, go for it. Uh, Ryan, that was great, thank you. Um, in your opinion, has the idea or the implication of counterinsurgency in regards to how the United States DOD implements it, has that failed or have we just not figured it out yet? You mean, are you, mean, are you asking me how the United States the Department of Defense's policies to effectively manage counterinsurgency, are they effective, are they working? Is, um, I think that Petraeus in 07 with the surge effectively quieted the counterinsurgency to a great degree. But you got to look at what cost. I mean, how much? How much did it cost us? You know, I mean, uh, originally, well, who was it? General Shinseki wanted to send 300,000 troops into Iraq because he said 80,000 wouldn't be enough. Well, it turned out that 80,000 wasn't enough, and Shin and then General Petraeus came in with more soldiers, but I mean, yeah, if we sent 500,000, we probably could have stopped them really well, you know? So it's uh, it's effective, but at what cost? But that's not, I mean, I, you know, that's not something that really interests me. It's how effective are we at stopping the counterinsurgency. It's how effective are we at stopping the war in the first place. Like, you don't have to fight the counterinsurgency if you don't go. Thanks. That sounds great. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's a good question. That was very good. Uh, all right, gents. Um, so I have a final question. Actually, sorry, uh, sorry you joined late, Ryan. You'll have to, um, I'll have to be more clear next time. And we had another gentleman that had technical difficulties. So uh, next time you'll have to uh, join us when we start and uh, jump right into the panel. Uh, so the last question is, and um, we'll go again left to right. So during your time in Iraq, interacting with the Iraqi people directly, what impression did you gather 
about their ability to cooperate under democratic rule, to keep some of the infrastructure and systems that we attempted to establish, to create some sort of um, rule or order, not necessarily in the way they had done it in the past, but um, you know, we went in there to give them democracy. What was your impression dealing with the local population of their desire to do that or their ability to um, uphold some sort of a system like that? I don't know if I have the, the greatest viewpoint to answer this question, but I'll do my best. Uh, a lot of my interaction with uh, local Iraqis was um, I was interacting with uh, highly educated um, uh, translators, uh, college educated, and not your, not your typical average Iraqi. And um, the ones I, uh, I was able to have uh, long discussions with, they, they seemed like intelligent people that could, uh, could uh, handle a democracy uh, a lot like the United States. But, um, like I said, that's, that's not the average Iraqi. Uh, my interactions with, with your average Iraqi was very fake. They, they put on this, uh, um, this fake smile and they give you a thumbs up and they say, uh, George Bush number one. And it's like, oh, hell no. Hell no. <laughs> and so that was kind of uh, the only interactions I really got with the, the local people outside of our translators. Has it disappointed you to see the situation devolve and all of the concurrent violence since we've um, since we've removed ourselves from the country? Oh, it's it's terrible to see that. I mean, um, uh, I, I developed a, a fondness for the for the Iraqi people and. Uh, I figure if I was over there, we're trying to do good. A lot of the soldiers uh, have that mentality. They they wanted to help the Iraqis out, and now that we pulled out, and we we think it's over, and then this group ISIS or ISIL comes in, and just completely undoes a lot of what we did, and is causing all kinds of death and mayhem. Um, it, it's just terrible to see. Yeah, I, I agree. I lost uh, friends and relatives and people that I love dearly, um, giving them democracy, and it's, um, it's tragic what's mm -hmm. occurring, uh, not just for the lives and the, the bodies and souls that were sacrificed, but also for the local population um, that died, you know, in some estimates, uh, several hundred thousand, if not a million, during old Alan Greenspan. Um, so if you um, want to jump in, Michael, and um, kind of let us know what you think. Um, something that's lost on... Uh the Americans, uh, not just those back home, but also those that went there in some, uh, I'm not going to say all members of the DOD, but some members of the DOD, um, after a while lose sight that the Iraqis are people, and they want essentially what we want. They want to have their families, they want to have a job, have their property, be left alone for the most part go to church or the mosque and live their lives. And um, uh, I, I think that's lost in a lot of people. I spent my time in Iraq in smaller cities, never Baghdad and uh, the larger cities there, but outside of Ramadi and uh, gone through around Fallujah a time or two. And uh, just... it. I, I was around the farmers, and I was around the butchers, and I was around the mechanics and the electricians and the construction workers. And it's hard, it, it's hard for me to differentiate the difference between an old man in Iraq working on a lavender field and my grandfather, who is like 70-something now and still works in his garden. And he, they both want the same things. They don't want soldiers in their yard. They don't want police kicking down their doors. And they want to be left alone for the most part. Um, do they give a damn about the democratic process or what form of government rules over them? If they're left alone, they don't give a shit. They don't care. Um, now I say that after uh, my second deployment, spending time living with the Iraqi army and training them, and I had multiple uh, Iraqi army NCOs and officers that I talked to, say, hey, how do you feel about this... Uh, the seeds of democracy we're planting here, and being told that we don't care for man-made laws. Our laws are divine. We appreciate 
you know, you getting rid of Saddam, George Bush, number one. And, uh, <laughs> but no, we, we have our laws, and they were passed down to us from our divine prophet. We do not want or need man-made laws. Thank you, though. We do appreciate it. Um, it, it. It's important to remember that the Iraqi people are people, and they aren't just statistics, whether it's 100,000 or a million. They are people. And they have suffered for more than a decade. There are inter generations of elderly, middle-aged, and young people are being raised up and living their lives with crippling PTSD in Iraq. And the idea that somehow they're going to magic themselves into a functional, friendly, productive democracy, it, it's a bridge too far in my opinion. That's, you know, that's um, very sad because we often talk a lot about how American soldiers return with post-traumatic stress and um, we really don't talk often about, you know, the birth defects from the ordinances that we dropped um, all the way to the post-traumatic stress that is now probably inflicting uh, everyone from the elderly to children that grew up um, under a very violent occupation. So that's a, it's a very good perspective. We don't talk about that enough. Brian? Okay. Um, well, I, I, I really don't have a lot to say on the topic, um, based because of the nature of my mission and specifically the nature, or the nature of my, my specific mission and my unit's mission. Well, I have one and two. I really didn't have a lot of contact with the Iraqi people, um, other than seeing them. I mean, I, 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 I uh, yeah. Specifically to answer that question, I don't. I know, yeah. not, not very interesting. Yeah. I appreciate your honesty, at least. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, cool. Well, uh, sorry you got here late, Ryan, but we'll do it next time. It'll be. Uh, I appreciate you joining uh, at the hour. So we very, very appreciate that. Um, so thank you, gentlemen, so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Please join us next time for a roundtable discussion. I'd like to do this probably about twice a month um, on these matters regarding foreign policy, war on terror, interventionism, you name it, uh, from a veteran's perspective. And uh, you know this stuff is important for the American people and um, and other veterans to hear. So uh, you can find a general transcript of this interview on my publishing site, TiffanyMadison.Liberty.me, and of course uh, like, share, and subscribe from Liberty Me's YouTube channel. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Uh, thanks. <laughs>